to be recorded on YouTube. This does get put on our YouTube channel and we do uh, send it out to everybody. Please turn your cameras off now. Um, hello everyone, welcome. My name is Ruth Kapolis. I'm the National Content and Media Relations Manager at JDRF. And on behalf of everybody here, I would like to welcome you to our Let's Talk T1D educational series, uh, which is on mental health tonight. So we will be opening the night with updates on JDRF's mental health strategy led by program manager, Amanda Hillman. And she will be followed by a presentation from Dr. Michael Vallis, PhD, R. Psych who is an associate professor of family medicine and adjunct professor of Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at Dalhousie University, as well as an affiliate scientist research for Nova Scotia Health. I think that's the longest title I've ever read. I'm very proud of myself for getting through that. And uh, we hope to have about 15 minutes for Q&A following. Uh, if this is your first time coming tonight, welcome. JDRF is a global leader working towards an end to type 1 diabetes. Uh, through re research funding and advocacy. JDRF also supports people and families in the T1D community from the time of diagnosis by helping those living with T1D to have better, healthier, and safer lives while we work towards finding a cure. As visitors on Is Slack, somebody talking? I don't hear anything. Uh, yes, I'm speaking. I'm not sure who that was, but if you maybe wanted to just log out and come back on again and see if it works that way. Can everybody else hear me okay? Yep. Okay. You seem to be good. Okay, thank you. Um, so as, as visitors on this land, I'd just like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that the JRF Canada National Support Office is located on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenau Sea, and Wendat. The education series offers information on a new topic every other month. Uh, next month, we will be discussing reproductive health and T1D. We also host a virtual connection series on the fourth Wednesday of each month. This is an unstructured opportunity to connect with others with no formal programming. And the next one will be Wednesday, June 26th at 12 p.m. Pacific and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, there is a raise hand button if you need clarification throughout the presentation. You can do that, but we're encouraging everybody to post their questions in the chat, and we will try to get to them at the end of the night. We will also be providing a JDRF contact email address in the chat, and you will get that tomorrow as well in an email. And um, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but just a reminder that we won't be able to answer any individual questions about personal mental health concerns. The mental health matters, and especially for people with T1D. People with diabetes are more likely to experience mental health challenges such as depression, anxiety, and eating disorders, and can benefit from interventions that prevent or treat these mental health conditions. This session will outline why it is normal to think and feel certain ways about having T1D, how accepting and adjust adjusting to change can be hard, but will provide tips and coping strategies to help you better manage living with a chronic condition or to be a caregiver to a person living with T1D. And on that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Amanda. Thank you so much, Ruth. Hello, everyone. So I am Amanda. As Ruth mentioned, I'm the National Manager of Mental Health with JRF Canada. And I'm going to give you a quick overview of our mental health strategy, sort of where we started and where we are today. All right, is everyone able to see my slides? Yeah, you're good. Great. Okay. Uh, so like Ruth mentioned, uh, we know, we've known for a long time that people who live with diabetes are at greater risk of mental health disorders than those without diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is a condition that's 24-7. It doesn't have breaks. You don't get days off. And the burden of self-management can sometimes be overwhelming. Yet there's a lot of gaps in care for people who live with type 1 diabetes um, in regards to mental health. Um, oftentimes, routine diabetes appointments rarely address mental health, and even if they do, healthcare providers often don't know where to refer their patients as there is no current referral pathway. And then to complicate matters, there's actually very few mental health providers in Canada that actually understand the unique needs and mental health concerns that come along with living with a chronic condition like diabetes. There's also a lack of funding for psychosocial research, and the evidence that does exist is 
often not put into practice. So these are sort of where, where we started and some of the gaps that we're trying to fill with um, the initiative that JDRF Canada is running. So we launched our mental health strategy in late 2021 as part of JDRF's overall improving lives strategy. And we took a three-prong approach. The first is to fund new research in this area uh, to both develop and test different psychosocial interventions in people who live with type 1 diabetes. Uh, we also focused really strongly in training for mental health providers to help close that knowledge gap that exists. And we also recognize that there was a need for community education and engagement on mental health, both for the type 1 diabetes community, but also for healthcare providers to help bring this forward as part of the everyday conversation of what it's like to live with type 1 diabetes and make sure that it's not forgotten about and, and really normalize it as part of everyday diabetes care. So on to the training program, which was our really our first big initiative on the program side that we launched um, in collaboration with Diabetes Canada. Uh, we introduced the mental health and diabetes training program uh, last year in March in both English and French. So it's a fully bilingual training program. And this is really intended to close this knowledge gap that exists because there aren't a lot of providers that um, have the knowledge and skills to best support their patients who live with diabetes and have the screening tools um, necessary to recognize that diabetes distress is different from depression and it might, um, they might not catch it if they're using a traditional depression screening tool. So to help fill this gap, we've been working to train uh, registered Canadian mental health providers through this virtual program. Um, and the program was developed by a diverse expert committee um, with both people who live with diabetes and a number of different types of um, healthcare backgrounds. Um, Michael Vallis was the co-chair along with Trisha Tang to make this a reality and is currently one of our facilitators. And we, while we were developing a program, we heard from the community that they, they wanted something um, to also learn about mental health. So even though this program was designed for mental health providers, we did actually open up a secondary stream for people who live with diabetes, as well as other healthcare professionals like nurses and diabetes educators to also have access to this knowledge um, and learn about how diabetes and mental health intersect and how they relate to one another. Um, the program itself is consisted of self-paced e-learning modules, which is approximately seven hours to run through. Um, and it has a three hour live interactive session that's dedicated for mental health providers. Uh, this program strongly features the lived experience of people with diabetes. Um, we, it has over 40 different videos of people speaking about their experiences, and it does touch on both type 1 and type 2 as there is a strong connection, and it also helps providers to learn the difference and help identify how these needs to be treated differently. Uh, so far, I'm pleased to share that we've had 266 mental health providers complete the program so far um, across both languages, and we have plans to continue to train providers throughout 2024 and beyond. And uh, as of now, for this year, we have a total of 18 of those three-hour live sessions planned, so many running in both English and French. Uh, we're also excited to share that um, in the first year of the program's launch, JDRF Canada was approved as a sponsor of continuing education for psychologists by the Canadian Psychological Association, and it is valid for 10 continuing education credits. And then to further boost our reach and update in Quebec, because we did see that there was a lag and a challenge to um, access that province, we separately sought continuing education approval from two of the major um, colleges in mental health, uh, and we received approval from both of them earlier this year. So that's the Order of Social Workers, Family and Marriage Therapists of Quebec, as well as the Order of Psychologists of Quebec, which cover, covers both psychologists and psychotherapists. And the other piece that was sort of thought alongside and built alongside the training program was the Mental Health and Diabetes Directory. So this launched later in uh, last year uh, in September, and this program or initiative is an online publicly available directory of providers available in both English and French and is also a collaboration with Diabetes Canada. The purpose is it 
to act as a connection tool. It's really designed to enable people from across the country who live with diabetes as well as their care team to easily identify and refer themselves or their patients to qualified mental health providers. When you log onto the website, you can search by province and see the different listing. You can filter by language, adults versus peds, um, or provider type. If maybe your insurance only covers psychotherapists, for example, and you have that ability with the directory. Now, to be listed in the, the directory, providers actually do have to complete the training program. We want to make sure that they have this baseline knowledge um, in order to be eligible. So as we continue to train providers in the program, which only launched last year, um, the directory will continue to expand. And we currently have just under 130 providers across the country. And with both of these initiatives, we also recognize that it was really important to understand what the impact of the programs would be. So alongside of this, we are funding a research impact grant out of the University of British Columbia to help us measure and determine if the processes we have in place are working well, if the directory and the training program are doing what they're supposed to do, and ultimately measure the impact uh, through both patient and provider outcomes. Another exciting initiative um, that was announced last year was the JDR of Canada Mental Health and T1D Community Grants Program. Uh, so we recognize that there was a need for community programming. And so we launched this program. We announced it in May of last year and announced the successful recipients in January of 2024. And it's always been part of our strategy to drive the development of community-facing programs that will ultimately support mental health and wellness in the type 1 diabetes community, but also build capacity in communities themselves. So this incubated initiative was designed ultimately to provide seed funding to organizations to transform um, exciting and creative and innovative ideas into projects that would ultimately support the mental health and wellness of the type 1 diabetes community. These projects were awarded up to $20,000 each and are taking place over an 18-month period. Each program is offering a unique, creative um, mental health program, and it is working to provide interactive ways to improve mental wellness among the type 1 diabetes community. Um, the different programs are, encompass anything from um, adding new mental health content into existing programs, creating a new program of mental health to support adults living with type 1 diabetes, um, looking at newly diagnosed children and creating a virtual uh, web comic to support their transition and, and acceptance of the, of the condition. Um, we also have a program funded in French, which will be um, collecting video segments on what it's like to live with type 1 diabetes and mental health. And there's also going to be a variety of in-person programming opportunities at a community health center. So we're very excited to see where the project go and to hear about the outcomes and impacts on mental health uh, in 2025 when these will be wrapping up. So like I mentioned is there's also uh, a huge gap in funding for research in, in mental health and type one diabetes. So as JDRF is a research first organization, um, we partnered with both the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and Brain Canada to fund seven different research studies with an investment of approximately $5 million so far. Um, these different research studies are exploring different methods, which are a combination of virtual or hybrid, and their focus uh, is varied, but also a lot of it is focused on reducing diabetes-related distress in a variety of populations. Uh, across these seven projects, there's a very strong focus in the youth and young adult population, uh, with a number of studies exploring peer support as a mechanism for support during the very difficult transition period from youth to adulthood, as well as pediatric to adult care, which is what we know where we see a lot of drop-offs, a lot of um, you know, ownership of individuals taking on their own care and, and in some cases not being prepared or not having the support systems in place. Um, so looking at mechanisms to support that transition is a, a large investment right now. So in 2024, we've already been um, quite busy. So we are continuing to fund this research, this ongoing research in mental health and are also exploring new opportunities. 
Uh, we're focusing on building awareness of the mental health and diabetes directory. Uh, we recently had a social media ad campaign. Maybe you saw it show up on your social media feed um, to uh, reach the type 1 diabetes community. And we're also really trying to promote the mental health and diabetes training program among mental health providers to encourage them to register. And this program is free right now. Um, it's a really fantastic program to have. A program that offers continuing education at no cost is really something that we're trying to do to reduce barriers, to get this knowledge in the, into the hands of as many people as possible. Uh, we also have plans uh, to build out a new page on our website to support the development of new digital video resources about the lived experience of mental health and type 1 diabetes to, land, to launch late this year. Uh, this content de development decision was made after consulting with our Mental Health Advisory Council, which is a group of over 100 Canadians with lived experience of type 1 diabetes, and this was done through an online survey and a number of focus groups that we conducted virtually. We're extremely grateful to this volunteer council that has provided critical feedback on a number of our mental health initiatives and also has really helped inform our decision making. Um, and planning for virtual events for the community, including both this event and future events in the fall that will touch on type 1 diabetes and disordered eating. Um, for both the community and running a similar webinar on that topic for healthcare providers um, are in the works as well. Uh, so I hope you found this uh, update exciting and that it's really demonstrated some of the first major steps and progress that's made in a very short period of time. Thank you. All right, so I should take over now. Um, I'm, this is uh, I'm Michael Ellis, uh, and I'm going to share my screen with you. And um, I'd like to um, spend the next uh, maybe 30 minutes uh, kind of sort of sharing with you our, our, our perspectives on uh, mental health in type 1 diabetes. In particular, my interest is really in empowering individuals. And so as you heard from Amanda, we're really trying to, to spread the word, spread the knowledge, really share uh, with uh, the professional community as well as the public, just the whole issue of the um, psychological issues associated with diabetes, in particular type one diabetes. You'll see both my name and Zosia Anders' uh, name here because uh, Zosia is my colleague who's doing this uh, exact same presentation in French this evening. Um, and so some of the takeaway messages I think we could leave everyone with is, is diabetes is a burdensome disease in which most people are doing their best to cope. Our job is to support individuals. This one is actually really important because in the medical system, it's very easy for, for us to take a medical model. Okay, what's the problem? You know, there's the, there's the, this is the person's problem that they need to do something. Uh, and we look at people as though they have problems to solve, not that people are doing their best to cope and they've got lots of resources and our job is to enhance those resources. And that's really where the mental health perspective comes in. And I'm going to kind of provide a bit of an overview for, for everyone so we can kind of understand where the mental health issues begin. And then I'm going to talk about how we can um, address those. Um, in the medical system, we're very good at making diagnoses and, and then making recommendations, but we have to really appreciate where the individual is and how we can support them to move forward. Um, and so what's really fascinating about diabetes is that it's both a pure biomedical disease and at the same time, a psychosocial challenge. And so many healthcare providers think that, that their role is simply to manage the disease aspect. And this is something that um, I've been involved in diabetes for over 35 years now as a psychologist. And, and it's been quite lonely actually for quite a long time. Um, but we start to see that, that in fact, the management of diabetes can't be complete without the management of psychosocial issues, the mental health aspects. But again, here, the new message that we're trying to send is that it, it's not just about referring out. So it's common in diabetes centers when we encounter someone who's struggling to think, oh, well, maybe we need to send you to the mental health clinic. And, and in fact, that may or may not be the case, but most of the issues that we encounter are actually secondary to the disease. They're sort of what we call disease-based distress issues. And these ones are important because if you step back, um, what you see on the slide here is a really a good way of understanding how we experience our emotions. 
And so we often begin this journey by identifying a problematic emotion. You're feeling anxious, you're feeling sad, you're, 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 you're becoming irritable. And it's very easy for us to think, oh, okay, well, what do I do about it? Turns out that one of the really effective strategies to helping deal with those emotions isn't to think, what do I do next? But actually to step back and try to get a perspective of, well, how did you end up in that situation? Because the perception of threat naturally leads to the feeling of anxiety. The perception of loss naturally leads to the feeling of sadness. And the perception of unfairness will naturally lead to the feeling of anger. And so when we start to see these emotions of anger and sadness and anxiety, we need to be thinking, is there a threat here? What is the threat? And if you think about what it's like to live with type 1 diabetes, is there a threat? Absolutely. Complications, hypoglycemia. Is there loss? Absolutely, right? There are things that you, uh, burdens that you have to take on, the financial burden, et cetera. Is there unfairness? Of course there is, because people with diabetes aren't relieved of other stresses and challenges. They have to manage all of the stresses and challenges that anyone else would manage. But then on top of that, they need to manage their diabetes, which can take up to about 300 decisions a day. So somebody who does not live with diabetes doesn't have to deal with any of those decisions. A person with type 1 diabetes faces up to 300 decisions. Who's not going to be burdened by that? And so this is a useful way of understanding because if you understand what a person is feeling, you can then organize strategies to support them. As a psychologist, I kind of view the, the, the management of type 1 diabetes as a journey. And as you can see here, I've identified three hurdles, three challenges that are fairly typical that have strong mental health impact. And the first one is what we call disease acceptance. Somehow you need to come to terms with this disease. And type 1 diabetes changes over time. The longer you have it, the more likely you will have complications. You enter different stages, different stages of life, different stages of health. And at all of these stages, there's an acceptance that is required. And so this is an important issue for us to be aware of. And we believe that those of us who support people with diabetes can actually do a lot to help them with that issue. The second issue is what we call treatment acceptance. What, are, what is the person's experience and attitudes to the treatments that are being offered? And then readiness for self-management. How do we help people organize their life so that those 300 decisions they have to make a day aren't tremendously burdensome, but actually that they're prepared to manage? So I'm just going to quickly kind of walk us through each of these issues, and then we'll talk about some strategies for coping. So let's talk about diabetes acceptance. This is a question as a psychologist in the field, I love to ask people, what's it like to live with diabetes? And let me show you a word cloud. So this was a conference that I put on uh, for Northern Ontario about a year or two ago. And I asked people at the conference, I said, let's use this, this activity. It was a digital activity. And I said, you know, what words do people use to, to describe what it's like to live with diabetes? And here's the word cloud. You can see it here. Frustrating, why me, regimented, overwhelming, tiring, hard, stressful. You can see here, there's no positive words. So it, it, we have to really accept that there's a burden that can be associated with this disease. It puts us in mind of the Godfather and, and, and this phrase from the Godfather, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. And this tells us that no one wants to be sick. And this is why disease acceptance is important. If you have a lot of issues that you're managing in your life and then more come on, this can be challenging. And so when we think about what's, what is difficult about living with diabetes, it's pretty obvious that that it's a demanding disease and, and it can be overwhelming. There's a lot of tasks that need to be taken into consideration. It's also very complex. It's very difficult to describe. If you were to assess your level of diabetes control at any moment in time, to describe, well, how did your A1C get to this point? How did your blood glucose get to this point? It's actually not so easy to, to do because there are so many factors that can play a role. And most of us would would say that, you know, we can get tired of things. So, you know, maybe you love your job. But I also know if you do love your job, 
You also like the weekends where you don't have to work and you look forward to summer vacations when you can go away and eventually you want to retire. So now imagine a disease where there are no weekends, there are no vacations, and there is no retirement, right? And so this becomes challenging. And so because of the constant nature, and so this is just sort of the actual normal experience. And as those of us with diabetes and those of us supporting individuals with diabetes start to appreciate this, you can see how rather than feel like what's wrong with you, just buck up, you need to kind of face this. We can say, wow, you know, this is not an easy disease to manage. When we talk about disease acceptance, there's two sort of concepts that are important for a person. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a fluctuating experience. So depending on what's going on in your life, it may be easier or harder to accept your disease. And one of the ways we can support people is if we think about the issue of the perceived seriousness of the condition and the perceived responsibility that you have for it. And you can see here, you can kind of divide this up. Some, you know, you may be at a point in time where your, your perception of the disease is overwhelming. Um, and this may be challenging to you, or you may be focused on other aspects of your life. One of the challenges that happens at adolescence, when you're trying to complete school, you're trying to figure out your career, you're trying to develop relationships, the disease might step to the background. Um, similarly, personal responsibility. It's very challenging because we don't believe that people with diabetes can do everything on their own. So we know that social support is really, really important and how we can kind of support other people. So for instance, one of the things that I find really interesting is the one of the you know kind of comments that people can make around eating behaviors. And so it's not uncommon in relationships Think about a person with diabetes so trying to support a person without uh, a person without diabetes, trying to support a person with diabetes. And they say, should you be eating that? Or maybe you should do something. And what's challenging about that is that we never quite know whether that's going to be a helpful comment or not helpful comment. And what's hard for people to do is ask the question, how can I support you rather than should you be eating that? And so this issue around responsibility is a very fluctuating one. And as you can see here, uh, people can be in different states. And what I like about, about the, the psychological perspective, unlike a disease state, where if a person has a disease, that disease stays with you. Your psychological experience is quite variable and it can, it can shift. And so by understanding the person's emotional experience, we can actually support the person to move forward. And this is where we've really distinguished this. And Amanda made a comment about this as she was introducing this. And that is, it's very common in the, in, in the medical field for us to screen for depression. And that, that's worth doing for sure. But one of the things that we've discovered over the last decade or so is that the individuals living with diabetes are more burdened by the experience of their disease. And so this is called diabetes distress. And one way of understanding it is, as you see on this question on the screen, if you were to ask a person, if you didn't have diabetes, would you be experiencing this? And if the person says to you, well, it has nothing to do with my diabetes, well, then you might be thinking that perhaps they're depressed. But if they're saying, no, this is the disease, then this is an indication of what we call diabetes distress. So this is the diabetes disease acceptance issue. It can fluctuate. If you're supporting someone with type 1 diabetes, recognize that there may be different stages of their life. So imagine you've had diabetes for 20 years, 30 years, and you start to develop complications. Well, the disease acceptance issue will raise itself again in that circumstance. What about treatment acceptance? And this one actually is really important because for many people in their care, the physicians, the clinicians, the educators make the recommendations, but they don't necessarily take into consideration the attitudes or beliefs that a person has. And this is really, really important because we have to understand what the person's beliefs are. And as you see on the screen here, just to give you some example, people can sometimes be reluctant to change treatment because of some of these beliefs. And so, you know, it's easy for people to think, oh, you must be sicker if you're on three medications than if you were on one. Or you have a personal experience 
that um, makes it challenging for you to accept some of the treatments. And so one of the things that we've learned is asking people about their attitudes towards their therapies. To what extent do you need it? To what extent do you have concerns about it? This is called treatment acceptance. So as an example, if we were to ask someone who's, let's say someone, a physician would recommend a particular therapy approach, we might say, to what extent do you think you need this? Or, and then to what extent do you have concerns about this? And you see in this little box on the screen here, someone could present with high need and low concerns. They would be accepting. But equally important is for us to identify people who might say, well, I think I need this medication, but I'm worried about it. Because that person would be pulled in two directions. They're ambivalent. What about the person who says, I don't think I need it. I'm not worried about it. They're kind of indifferent about it. Or I don't think I need it and I'm worried about it. They're kind of skeptical of it. And the point of this slide is just to help us to recognize that the attitudes that people have about their therapies are very, very important for us to bring into the conversation so that we can support the person. What do you say to someone who's skeptical about a medication? This was very common. I don't know if you remember this, but when the COVID vaccine first came out, many, many people were skeptical because they worried that the drug, the vaccine was developed too quickly. And so the lag time between COVID being recognized and the vaccine, no vaccine has ever been developed that quickly. And so some people were concerned that, oh, it can't be safe because it was, it was done so quickly. In fact, it was quite safe. And the reason it was done so quickly is like research stopped. So at my university during COVID, you couldn't do research. You couldn't do any research. The only research that the university allowed was COVID-based research. So all the research, research, you know, kind of equipment and, and, and funding and technologies were devoted to the development of the vaccine. So it wasn't that it wasn't safe, it was actually fast-tracked. But it's important for us to recognize these attitudes. Um, this is something that is part of what we call shared decision-making. This is called the SURE test. And, and I really encourage people to to sort of think about it this way. When you're you know, supporting somebody in their treatment journey, understanding what their attitudes and their, their what we call shared decision-making. And so you can see this is quite simple. Do you feel sure about the best choice for you? Do you know the benefits and risks of each option? Are you clear about which benefits and risks matter most to you? And do you have enough support and advice to make a choice? You can see from this perspective that what we're really trying to do is bring into the treatment plan the person's attitudes and in particular identify any concerns that they have. And so if this was to uh, be filled out by somebody um, and they indicated no to any of those questions, that would be really good because then this would indicate that there's need for more discussion, there's need for more support. And we know that sometimes adherence rates to medical treatments are lower than we would like. And we believe that the reason that the adherence rates are lower is because people don't have enough time to talk about their concerns. Now we're gonna sort of touch on this concept of readiness, which is helping people to overcome the barriers to change. And what's really interesting about this is to normalize that change is hard. And so when we consider the human condition, the way that the brain is actually made, you have sort of two competing impulses. You can see this little guy on the teeter-totter. On the one side is the heart, on the one side is the head. And how does that play out if you live with diabetes? Well, you know, what do you know you should do? And what do you feel like doing? And they're not the same. That's what's really important. They are not the same. And it's helping people to sort of work that through because we know that change is hard. So what do we know about behavior? Healthy behavior is actually abnormal behavior. The way that our behavior is primarily guided is that we focus on pleasure, convenience, and immediate consequences. This is the sort of normal operating system of the brain. Not only that, but avoidance is the most common coping strategy. So we believe that these are important to understand so that we can support people in going from some of these challenges 
towards where they need to go. And if you look at type two diabetes, which is the fastest growing disease on the planet, it's primarily being driven by the fact that human behavior is guided towards pleasure, convenience, and immediate consequences. It's also important to understand in the medical community, in relationships, that people actually don't follow what other people say. They follow their own beliefs. And if we push too far, and if we push too hard, one or two things can happen. The person will resist us and just think about COVID and all of the protests that happened because people felt that they were being pushed into behaviors that they weren't comfortable with. So if you push somebody too hard, they'll resist. That's actually normal. It's called psychological reactance. Or they might try because you want them to, but they're not really committed. So they fall into this, I try and I fail. I try and I fail. And eventually, I might stop trying. This is called learned helplessness. And so it's important for us to appreciate this. And then we know that the emotional area of the brain and the logic area of the brain are not the same. They're not the same parts of the brain. And emotions dominate logic, which is why social support and understanding is so important because we need to help people work through their emotions. And so I talked a bit about the perception of threat leads to the feeling of anxiety, perception of loss, to the feeling of sadness, and the perception of unfairness to the feeling of anger. So what do you do about those? Well, those emotions, if you can explain the person. So just imagine you're living with type 1 diabetes and you have a hypoglycemic reaction, which could be fatal. Talk about a threat. I lost consciousness. I, I couldn't treat myself. This is incredibly threatening. Person's going to feel quite anxious about that. And how do you help someone with that? It's actually you normalize it. And coping is really about support and expression. And it's only the secondary emotions that where those feelings kind of get out of control that we actually think about referral. And so tremendously beneficial to supporting people living with diabetes is the ability to give that person the opportunity to fully express themselves and to receive support without necessarily trying to change them. Okay, so now let's shift a little bit, and I want to talk about some coping strategies. If we sort of think about part one of this presentation as sort of trying to understand the person who's living with type 1 diabetes, where some of their distress comes from, and understand it in a way that can kind of normalize it and establish a supportive relationship, now let's talk about coping strategies. And so when we talk about coping strategies, one of the things that we want to sort of help you to, to recognize is, is the question that you see there. Do you feel that you can control the source of the stressor? So is this a problem that could be solved? And so if it's a yes, it's a problem that could be solved. I'm worried about, you know, not being prepared enough to give a talk tomorrow. Well, what can you do today to prepare? Because it, it, until you get to the talk, you can actually prepare for it. So if there's things that you can do, then this is where problem solving comes into bear. And if you tackle a problem, breaking it down into smaller steps, it can be really effective. If you can't control it, can you manage it? That is, can you sort of deal with your reaction? And this is where we talk about working with our thoughts and working with our emotions. How do we, you know, so for instance, here's a, here's a phrase that you might take with you. You don't have yeah. to believe everything you think, oh, right? So yeah. just imagine, you, oh, I, I can hear someone talking, perhaps you could put yourself on mute. So you can be in a situation where you might think, oh no, this is terrible. And then just remind yourself, you actually don't have to believe everything you, you think. It may not be quite as terrible. Maybe you've been able to cope with similar situations in the past or your emotional control. How do you um, you know, kind of allow yourself to feel the emotion. It's like a wave, it'll pass over you and it'll pass by. Um, what if you can't um, uh, control the stress and the emotional reaction can't be managed? And again, there's nice strategies in which we can sort of be calm in the situation, more of what we call acceptance that's based on sort of being in the moment 
and not becoming too focused. A lot of the distress that people experience is when their thoughts go to the future or to the past. And being in the moment provides lots of strategies that can be helpful. And so when we talk about problem solving, these are adapted to more controllable situations. And the two ways here to think about are, what do you do when it kind of comes up and you have to react? So you weren't sort of looking for it, you weren't aware of it, it just took you by surprise. Or what do you do when you kind of know that these situations can be, be difficult? And so how do you manage eating behavior in, let's say you go on a cruise ship? Well, you know, you can think about, you know, the situations that could come up that you're not prepared for, but you can do a lot of preparation for this. Um, secondary coping strategies are things where we talk about our thoughts. And so we can sort of, we call it the ABC model, which is you sort of have this kind of behavior, you have this reaction. Well, what led up to it and what followed it? And this is when you can start to think about what situations you can manage. What are your thoughts? What are your feelings? And separating out your thoughts and your feelings. And this is really where we talk about, we call it cognitive restructuring or just rethinking your thoughts. Um, you know, you might think, oh no, this is terrible. And you think, well, hang on a second, it's stressful, but I've been in situations like this before. And so this allows you to really take a pause. It pulls you, distances yourself a little bit from the situation and can kind of help you to sort of take a second go at it. One of the very useful strategies from a cognitive restructuring point of view would be, what would you say to a best, your best friend if they were in the situation that you're in? And that often we will look at our friends and our colleagues and our loved ones, and we have a perspective that can be very helpful to them. And sometimes when you're in the middle of distress, it's hard to think about that yourself. Attention shift is really important, how we can sort of shift our focus. Um, you can really, you know, sort of, if, if you're focused on a, on a worry, distraction can be very, very effective. And, you know, for instance, here's a grounding technique. It's very easy to do. Just think of, you know, let's imagine you're in a highly stressed situation. And I might say, okay, well, what do you hear? What do you see? What do you feel? What do you taste? What do you smell? Just orient to your five senses and that'll focus your attention away from the distress. And that can be actually super helpful. And so it's very useful to be thinking about how we can direct our attention like a beacon of a spotlight. Social support cannot be underestimated, um, but social support is tricky in diabetes because of the stigma. Um, many people living with diabetes experience negative, ex negative attitudes from other people. And so this one can be really difficult. Um, you know, if you feel uncomfortable um, with your pump device being seen by someone else, or if you had to bolus your insulin, um, imagine you were on injectable insulin and you were injecting in front of people. And, you know, so how comfortable are you doing that? And what we know is that many uh, people that don't have diabetes have negative attitudes towards this. And this is very challenging for people and something that we really encourage individuals to um, do their best to sort of find the people who can support them and be cautious around those people. Because as you see on the screen here, a lot of diabetes distress, a lot of, of, of self-management challenges um, are actually caused by other people's attitude. And so sometimes we, we encourage people to think about who is supportive and who isn't supportive and how do you stay close to the supportive people and protect yourself from the less supportive people. Um, social support, support resources, you know, think about it you know, from the perspective of your inner circle and then the outer circle. Um, and, and really, you know, which ones are the most important for you and which ones are, are worth your time? And of course, it's usually the inner circle relationships that are the ones that we would encourage you to really, you know, kind of take on and, 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 and try to resolve or, or improve. Some of the outer circle relationships may not be worth it um, in, in terms of the challenges. And look for the people that can support you. Don't be don't be shy to alter your 
social contacts so that you're surrounded by people who who get it, surrounded by people who understand. And I, I do a lot of work with Diabetes Canada. And one of the things that that's sort of dominating Diabetes Canada right now is called Change the Conversation, in which we're really trying to promote this much more open attitude, in particular, where we're trying to focus on people without diabetes and their attitudes towards people with diabetes. And so it's really valuable to think about, you know, empowering people with diabetes to kind of stay close to those who are supportive. And this sort of leads us to this concept of resilience, which is really the ability to bounce back, the ability to adapt to or recover. Um, it's not it's not the 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 stress really that is is um, the source of ongoing problems because stress is normal. Stress will happen. It's the response to stress, and this is where it can be really really helpful to think about you know the stress experience from a learning perspective. What is it that you can learn and how can you actually manage to bounce back? And resilient people have a idea where they are sort of, they're kind of okay. They're kind of a bit chill, right? The, you get it, you have a stressful situation and, and it's like, well, things happen and it's not in my control. Um, and they turn away from things that you can't change and turn toward things that you can change. So you sort of, you know, Put your sort of focus on where you will get some return on your in investment. Um, and then you sort of, you know, really be OK. You don't have to solve all the problems. Um, you know, you might see, let's say, workplace relationships. And these can be stressful sometimes. But it's like you don't have to catch every ball that's being thrown at you. Um, you can pick and choose. And so these are coping strategies that can be actually really, really helpful. Um, a concept that's worth keeping in mind is just the, you know, when we talk about the stress of diabetes being you know, pretty kind of continuous and, and there's lots of aspects of this disease that you know, it can impact. Again, I'll just remind you, 300 decisions a day can be challenging. This is where the concept of diabetes burnout comes from. And as you can see, here's some strategies. Acknowledge that it's challenging. Just recognizing Many people with diabetes who are feeling overwhelmed think, oh, I'm weak. And in fact, that's not true at all. People with diabetes are actually, you know, in my opinion, often stronger than people without diabetes. And the reason for that, of course, is because diabetes is on top of every other issue that would normally be experienced by others. Um, it's very interesting, you know, embracing the outdoors. This was something that, you know, I think has been sort of shown with COVID that, you know, really, you know, being in nature can be actually really, really helpful. Um, trying to maintain a positive attitude and and really you know problem solve, seek support, try a whole bunch of strategies. This can be really really valuable for managing burnout, and and trying to sort of you know kind of look at the glass as half full, not half empty. This sort of optimism and pessimism, and it's really interesting. Um, so when you look at at individuals living with type one diabetes, diagnosed as children. What's really interesting about those is that individuals who are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes as children often grow up to have better coping strategies than children without diabetes. It's really interesting. Two things that are associated with the experience of diabetes. One is, 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 is a, a gen, I guess, less neurotic, right? You know, what do I mean by that? Well, many of us might think we wanted a red one, we ended up with a blue one. Oh, we whine and we complain because we've got a blue one when we wanted a red one. Well, if you live with diabetes, you don't sweat the small stuff quite so much. I mean, if you're trying to manage hypoglycemia, you're trying to deal with a, you know, a, a new insulin pump, I mean, there are bigger fish to fry than, than smaller petty related issues. So there's a certain perspective that di living with diabetes kind of brings to people. The second issue is that Many people's relationships are fairly thin. They're, they're sort of like, as long as things are going well, we're having a good time, everything's fine. When things go wrong, oh, then, you know, it becomes challenging. But when you grow up with diabetes, you know that diabetes is a challenge. You know that it's a burden. And so often people who, who have diabetes as children grow up to actually have more, more strengths and, and actually are, are more able to support other people. And so this is something that's really, really interesting. And so as we sort of bring this 
presentation to a close, just to really think about how you can sort of really sort of encourage this sort of shift from pessimism towards optimism. And so I've left uh, uh, about 10 minutes here. I'm just going to stop sharing. And now I'm um, open to questions. And I hope that there have been some questions in the chat. And I think, Ruth, are you going to moderate this? I am. I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, if anyone had one, if you wanted to put your hand up, like put the hand up, and then I can ask you if you wanted to unmute yourself, or you can put your question in the chat. Were there any see, questions? At the at the top of the screen there, you'll see there's a, an icon there's a that says uh, uh, there's a little hand. And if you hit the hand, it'll signal on your computer and we'll see that you want to ask a question. Not seeing anything go up. I know it was a. Uh, oh, Here I see. Laurel, from Laurel, has, a, Laurel. has her hand yes. up. Hi. Hi, Laurel. Can you? Can, hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear Just you. Just fine. Great. I, no one was asking, so I thought I would chime in. Um, I'm a parent of a T T1D. Um, my daughter is seven years old. Um, I it's great listening to this chat. I'm definitely going to look take a look at the slides again. I think, you know, you've covered a lot of things. So I, I guess my question is just if thinking of a seven-year-old, <laughs> if you could um, give me some examples of, you know, how do I know if she's coping well or needs like additional support? And, and a second part to that question, I guess, is when she's feeling frustrated and sad about um, her diabetes, what are some things that I can either, you know, stay or like, you know, some tools for me to respond to that in that those types of situations? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. That, that, that's actually really, really, really helpful. So the first thing is um, try to sort of normalize the emotional reactions. And so, um, you know, I'll tell you something that 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 often is really helpful, and it's kind of I I I generally refer to it as the the three strike rule. And so, let's say your daughter was distressed, and you say, well, okay, how, should I be worried this about this or not? And let's say you kind of there's an episode, and you support her, and then there's a second episode, and and then there's a third episode, and then there's a you know so. If after, so the first episode indicates, okay, there's a reaction here. Let me try to support my daughter. Okay, now it happened again, strike one. It happened again, strike, it happened again. If you sort of see that pattern where you've, you've kind of said, we've done the best to support her as much as we can, I'm starting to feel like it's not working. Then, then that's when you might think, I'm going to talk to my pediatrician, I'm going to talk to the diabetes center about this and see what they think about this. Um, that can be actually helpful. In the moment, what do you do? And um, the emotional center of the brain is subcortical. It, it, it's actually unconscious. So our emotions aren't, aren't willed, they just appear. And the logical center of our brain is, 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 is conscious, not fully developed though for quite a long time. And so what you would wanna do there is give your daughter within your comfort zone, sufficient time to sort of express the emotions. So tell, you know, how you're feeling, you know, get, let her talk, you know, let her sort of get it out. Um, and when I talk about that, I'm talking about two, three, four, and five minutes. And what you look for is sort of a, a kind of a, a, a build of the emotion. And then from, for that, when people start to express their emotion, it, it sort of, it kind of vents. So it's like a pressure cooker and it kind of comes off. And then as the pressure comes down, then you start to hook into the coping strategies. So you might, you know, give the person a bit of time and then encourage an alternative activity, maybe something fun, something optimistic that would sort of be a focus. So I hope those general comments were were helpful. Yeah. I think there's a couple of other hands. Thank you. 
We do. Yeah. And we have one in the chat from uh, Ellen Carr, who's 76, and she's been living with 2ND for 51 years. Ellen, we have a few people who we've been speaking with because it's Shader F's 50th year as well. who have been living it with over 50 years. And she's done well, but lately feels that her aging body is letting her down and she can feel overwhelmed at times. So any suggestion of dealing with the pressure of living with long term diabetes and i i know we have a few other questions michael i don't know is michael's in halifax so he's an hour so it's almost 10 o'clock where he is but if you don't <laughs> mind staying on for another five or to seven minutes oh, yeah. Yeah, okay that's, that's that's quite okay yeah well you know ellen congratulations uh that's amazing 51 years uh you can teach us all a, a whole bunch um, and, and yeah, it, it, it's it's something that that I think is actually really really challenging. And so so it, it it actually can get harder over time to cope with the same situation, even though it's it's actually really really familiar. Um, I think one of the the things that would be important is to just really sort of what is how can you how can you 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 know give yourself sufficient breaks. So fifty one years of living with disease, you're probably a an expert at knowing you're kind of when things are kind of going okay and then not okay. And when things are kind of stable and okay, then that's a good time to really just sort of kick loose a bit, maybe sort of lighten the reins, you know, sort of, you know, vent some stress off. Um, certainly I would encourage you to seek support um, and, and hang around people. Um, I, and, and sometimes when you're, when you've lived with a condition long enough, you, you 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 might consider i don't know if you have contacts with other people that have diabetes but you're you know someone in your situation could have so much experience that it would be beneficial to 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 perhaps you know share some of what you know and so um maybe you could do something like write yourself a letter about you know what you've learned imagine at being 71 and sort of writing yourself a letter um for when you were 24 uh, what would you tell your 24-year-old self? Um, and that may sort of help you tap into all of the the resilience that you've developed over that time. Um, and so um, that um, hopefully would be helpful. All right. I saw that. Um, I think it was Sean who had his hand up first. I see. It. So, um, Sean, if you wanted to unmute yourself. Oh, I don't mind, but I think Ellie had her hand up first, and then Bonnie and I was third. So maybe oh, okay. I'll pass the um, baton. <laughs> that's very, that's uh, very gracious of you. So, ah, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. If you, uh, if Ruth, if you click on people, it'll show you the order of hands. Oh, I think that's oh, what, oh, I, I see. Now I'm answering Sean the chat was, at the yeah. same time. I apologize. Yeah. Um, Ellie, if you wanted to ask your question. <laughs> Yes, hi, uh, Dr. Vallis and uh, Ruth, Amanda, thank you so much for, for hosting this. And we really, really all appreciate it and for you to take the time to introduce these concepts to us. It's really uh, very informational and we can't wait to apply it all. Um, so my question in particular is about how to introduce this idea of mental health in to teens without being pushy. So I'm actually speaking um, uh, on behalf, I guess, of my brother. So my brother is the one who has uh, T1D. And um, I'm kind of like, I've experienced him ever since his diagnosis when he was 10, now transitioning into uh, being a teenager and uh, witnessing all of the different changes that, you know, that he's going through, but also wondering how I can support him through that through those transitions, through those changes without putting uh, like extra pressure on him, as well as like, this might be a little bit different, but overcoming those cultural and cultural barriers or stigma that we have from our own communities about seeking mental health. And even within our families, whether it's parents, like ideas that they grew up with, how can I help my brother? How can my parents and I help my brother to overcome those um, those beliefs and um, to get him to have the mental health support that he and uh, that he needs. It's a great, great question that you ask, Ellie. Um, you know, I think you're. It's really you know valuable. I think the first thing is is when we're trying to support other people. Um, I, the human nature is to try to give advice or try to get give suggestions. 
Um, and the problem with that is that people, if they're not ready to hear it, they don't like it. <laughs> and so um, the other strategy to take is, is to try to ex 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 sort of communicate only using questions. And so you're not sort of, you know, for instance, you might say, you know, isn't it, uh, you know, um, uh, do you ever find that, you know, that, that our culture makes it hard to manage diabetes? So you're, you're, you're trying to get this issue of cultural uh, attitudes towards mental health on the table. Make it a question, not a statement. It makes it a bit more gentle. Um, the other thing that I, I actually find it useful to ask the person a question like the following. You know, when you think about your diabetes, imagine that your diabetes was a, a, a an object that you had in an in a in a in a knapsack on your back. So how heavy is it? It is. Is it a one pound loaf of bread, a five pound sack of potatoes, a fifty pound iron anvil, or a two ton truck? It, it's a it's a question that that's kind of easy to relate to, and it's it sort of it takes the psychological burden and sort of um, it puts it into almost like a physical sort of space, and that's maybe a little bit easier for people to um, to to act upon. And I think uh, generally the other thing is just to really let people know um, that you're there to be supportive. Um, you know, so if you ever want to talk about it, I'm here for you. Um, and uh, it 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 is it is actually quite quite um, quite distressing. I was part of a international study that we did a number of about maybe eight or ten years ago now called the Diabetes Attitudes, Wishes, and Needs. And one of the things that I really liked about that study is that we didn't only look at the emotional burden of individuals living with diabetes, which was significant, but we also studied family members of people with diabetes. And we found that the burden that the family members experienced was 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 all uh, almost on par with the individual. And so one of the, the the things that that we can learn about that is that sometimes the family members can benefit from mental health support um, in terms of their own stress associated with this. So I hope those comments were helpful. And then it looks like Bonnie S, you're next, and then oh, John, and then the chat. Hi. Yes, thank hi you so there. much. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the answers you provided so far, Dr. Rallis, Um, because you've really answered a lot of my questions. I've been diabetic for 50 years, but this is really for directed to the parents of kids with diabetes. Send them to a diabetic camp. Please oh, yes, do. yes. Please yeah. do. Yeah. Because yeah. When, you know, just because I was the only kid in my entire school with diabetes, I was the freak. I was the one who had reactions and had injections and all this stuff and going to going to camp with a bunch of other diabetics turned me back into a human being. I was seven years old and it changed my life. And, and to this day, I have camp friends and we can talk to each other about complications. We can talk to each other about our A1Cs. We can talk to each other about, um, you know, continuous glucose monitoring, you know, like we have like, and it's just, you know, I wish there were diabetic camps for adults. That's, you know, oh, that's I wish that too. That's <laughs> yeah. So, so I think that'd be amazing. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's a real endorsement. One of the things that I've always found it's always been a bit of a shock to me when I been um, when I meet somebody with type one diabetes and they say to me, "I don't know anybody else who has type one diabetes." And I think to myself, "Oh my goodness, you've experienced your disease sort of in this isolation." And so for those of who, who aren't aware of this, uh, across the country, there are, are camps, so two-week camps, where the children living with type 1 diabetes will go to camp. And the camp's staffed by medical staff, and they are amazing. They are absolutely amazing, because what happens is that the children, are, the di children with diabetes are normal, and the people without diabetes are abnormal. So it's really fun. So you get the kids making fun of the camp counselors that don't have diabetes. And 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 Bonnie, it, it, the story you say about lifelong friends is also really true. Um, there's currently a, a series of events. You may want to be on the wear a lookout for them. We had ours in Halifax just last Saturday. They had one in Regina the weekend before. This weekend, they're having one in Toronto. 
and it's called Pump Couture. And it's a fashion show, um, individuals living with type one and type two diabetes, and they d demonstrate fashions, but they also demonstrate their technology. And it's a fundraiser for camps and also a way of pr promoting a public awareness. It's, it's actually really helpful. And, and I couldn't agree with you more. Normalizing diabetes is actually super important. And, and regardless of whether you have type one or type two diabetes, an, a, an interesting observation is that people living with diabetes are much healthier and have much greater health literacy than the average Canadian. And so, you know, being able to pull together and take advantage of that combined strength would be awesome. And Sean and then Paul, I see, have their hands up. Thank you, Dr. Vallis, and thank you very much for the presentation as well. Um, I'll give you a bit of background. Our son was diagnosed at 18 months about a year ago, so now he's just shy of three years old, very, very young, and he's starting to ask questions, he's starting to ask, how come I can't eat this? Uh, what do I need a bolus for? He's very interested in his cell phone, for good or for worse. Um, seeing as how he's more or less a blank slate at this point, what advice do you have to offer for us as he starts asking questions? What can we do to normalize it more, to make him have a positive experience, or at least as positive as it can be with respect to this, as it will hopefully not, but at least for this foreseeable future, be a lifelong thing for him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so first of all, um, Sean, thank you for the question. And, and I just need to, to, to make sure that I sort of declare you know, I, my focus is on adult sort of psycho. So, you know, I, I kind of work, my own particular expertise would be like, you know, 12 and above. So I don't, uh, I want to just sort of, you know, make my comments contextually around that. But but a general comment to you would be to, to answer his questions consistent with his level of cognitive development. And, and make it fun, make it normal, make it healthy. Um, and and really, you know, promote that um, that sort of uh, uh, open acceptance uh, 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 within his level of of development, and and that's where you might want to seek out a bit of counsel, maybe from your physician or the the diabetes center, in terms of what would be a good way. Um, uh, you know, many pediatric centers might be able to help you find things like a, a book you know, a little storybook that would incorporate diabetes into the story. Something that would allow it to be normalized, something that would allow it to be sort of really, really a, a positive experience. Because, you know, one of the things, and, and if you've ever done sort of um, organized JDRF events where um, uh, the uh, children are involved in in the presentation of, of the events, I've done a number of these over the years, and it's truly remarkable. I mean, I've been on stage where the MCs have been like 14, 15 years old, and they're the ones that are sort of organizing and running the meetings. And it's really remarkable to see the, the concept of empowerment there. So um, as early as possible. And, and also, I would just say to you that um, uh, the, the, you know, we all should be really optimistic about technology and about where the research is going uh, in, in this in this field. And so um, I think uh, I think a, a healthy dose of optimism here, Sean, would be would be, I think, really beneficial to everyone there. So I hope that was helpful. And I see, Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to comment uh, about people going through uh, their entire life without uh, coming in contact with others who suffer from the same uh, issues. Mm -hmm. um, I know uh, for almost 11 years now, JDRF has sponsored a group in Toronto uh, uh, where on a monthly basis almost, uh, we get together now, most of the time it's virtually unfortunately, but for the first, seven years or maybe it was live until COVID. Yes, yeah. Uh, and it's just a group of people all with T1D, um, sorry parents of, of younger children. This, this is an adult group uh, and we just get together, uh, if you wanna say to commiserate or share information. And uh, it's a very, uh, it used to be a bigger group and we used to get a lot of referrals from 
JDRF. Lately, uh, it's, it's become a very small group, but we're definitely open to receiving more uh, people. So if any, anyone here mm -hmm. knows anyone who'd like to join, uh, I, and I guess now you don't even have to be in Toronto because that's right. Toronto. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. But uh, if you want to get in touch with Erica Thompson at JDRF, she's the manager of volunteer and community engagement for Central Canada. And uh, I can give you her phone number uh, because she's the only way that we allow people in. We don't you know, we, we try to keep yeah. it all pretty uh, yeah. private. Excellent. Yeah. So so if I can make a comment, you said we're just a group and I would say don't use the word just a group um, because, you know, as a psychologist, I, I, what I would would say to you is that you're you 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 guys are supporting each other. The, the the way in which you go about that is actually critically important. And I think it's really when we we need more of those kinds of experiences, Paul, in the manage in the medical management system. I think, you know, so why are why don't all the diabetes centers, you know, have space and 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 facilitate this sort of uh, you know, uh, patient-led, person-led kind of groups and and I think part of what we're trying to do these all these initiatives that you're seeing with JRF etc you know if we can break down some of those walls because many of those groups Paul they do have sort of a bit of a life so it's actually not uncommon to say we started up bigger we're smaller now that's actually pretty common and so it's it's really about how do we support the rejuvenation of you know kind of a healthy dose of a you know, a new group or new people coming in. And so I think your comment is really well made. And and I, as a psychologist, I find that um, when you listen to people, you then, it's not like psychologists kind of tell people what to do or teach people what they don't know. I think we listen and we try to organize the, we, 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 we take what people say and we sort of support that in moving forward. And so I think that the empowerment of, of, a, of a group of individuals who would come together on this call, just imagine how many life years of type one diabetes are on this call right now at this moment. We know we've got 51 years from one person alone. There are you know, many other people in this room, uh, virtual room. We probably have, I don't know, what, three, 400 years? Of lived experience oh, yeah. in I this think room. It may, be, it may be more than that because you haven't heard <laughs> from me yet. I'm at 50, I'm at 54 years. Wow, that's amazing. Good for you. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments, Paul. I appreciate that. I think uh, we're getting on to being 9:15, which um, I'm not sure where everybody lives on this call, but I know it's <laughs> for Michael and potentially for others as well. Um, if you have other questions, something you think of later, uh, you can email me. I will put my email in here right now as well. Uh, the mental health strategy, I forgot that part, at jdrf.ca or general at jdrf.ca. If anything comes up uh, tomorrow or in the next few days that you wanted to let us know. But thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. Thank you for the engagement and for the participation. Thank you so much, Dr. Vallis. You're for, very welcome. Uh, uh, Thank you, everyone, joining us for tonight attending. and for this presentation yeah. and for staying on longer so that uh, everyone could get their questions in. Our, our next Wonderful. one will be on reproductive health in T1D. That's going to be in June. And then in September, that's the eating disorders in T1D. And we will be in October talking about stem cell therapies and then in November about self-management, and that includes all types of devices, also pens, multiple daily injections, and finger pricks, and device fatigue. So that's the slate for the rest of the year. And again, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Amanda, for the presentation as well, and for everything you do to bring this together and for managing this exceptionally important program. We're very grateful to you as well, and I hope that everybody has a really good night. Thank you for coming. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.